Good evening, folks. Tyson Anderson here. Just Talking Dogs, time is 6.55. We're going to go ahead and start this thing off. Um, you guys come on in. Uh, let's uh, talk a bit of dogs, if we will. And um, tonight we have a very special guest, Mr. Gary L.A. Brown from Brown's L.A. Beagles. Uh, some of you guys may remember the k -Wood dog that he has. Uh, you know, so many different dogs that he's put together. Uh, we're going to bring him on at 7 o'clock, if you will. Go ahead and uh, like the feed, share it, invite your friends and your followers. I hope your week has been going so good, that, uh, going good this, thus far. Um, if you can hear me, give me some thumbs up. I'm going to pray a little bit of Wings on a Dove by Mr. Furling Husky. And um, just so you guys know, if you will, I'll just give you a heads up. Um, if you will say a special prayer for Mr. Uh, Mr. Brown and his um and his church family they have suffered a uh, a dear loss and uh we've been hoping that we can um we can cover them with love so um we appreciate all that has came on we're hoping tonight that we have a good turnout um very very special gentleman that we're going to have on tonight um i think he's got a lot to say so we're going to let him do a lot of the talking if you guys will he said he'd prefer that you all ask a bunch of questions from the giddy up and uh you know we're gonna just go from there yeah this is my favorite hat you know i don't know i just i've got so many i got probably 30 40 hats i just i don't know i love this one so on the wings of a dove by mr furlin husky thought it was proper for the occasion i can't hear you is it d e so we're gonna start this off share it if you will thank you mr gordon thank you sir thank all of you all you all didn't have to join us join but you did appreciative of that go ahead and share the feed if you will let's go ahead and get a good followership on if we can Yes, it is. Songs I grew up on, folks, believe it or not. <laughs> I really did. It's, uh, it's a joy, I tell you. You know, um, you never know how songs can just um, allow you to touch back uh, some of the deepest of your roots. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Share, share, share. Invite those friends and followers, folks. We're just talking dogs. We're sitting around the campfire tonight. Come on in, come on in, guys. I tell you, rather excited, rather eager to earnestly see what he's going to have to say. Time is 6.58. We're going to bring him on right at 7 o'clock. We're excited to see what he's going to have to say, guys. I'm telling you, if you don't know him, he's been a pillar in the community. Uh, more than just Beagles. Um, he's a country gentleman. He's got a lot to say. Uh, even in the essence of just being a man and being a person of God. A uh, powerful gentleman he is. Him and I talked on um, various occasions intensely here here uh, recently. And um, I love his spirit. Love his spirit. And um, thought it not robbery to bring him on. So, time is 6.59. Mr. Bruno, I'm trying, sir. I, I, I wish I was a man. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody. About somebody that can save anybody. The river that day. 659, folks. Go ahead and bring those friends and followers on if you will. We're getting ready to light the campfire. Go ahead and get you a cold bottle of water. They tried to go out on us, but we know that's not going to work. Time is 7 o'clock. We're going to go ahead and call them on. Hey, Mr. Uh, Brown, how you doing, sir? Doing good. Doing good. Doing, doing good. That's good. That's good. Uh, well, the time is 7 o'clock, folks. We've got Mr. Gary Brown on the phone. Uh, thank all of you guys for uh, reaching out and listening tonight. You guys didn't have to do it, but you did, and we're, we're grateful 
Um, as I said, you guys, if you will continue to lift up the Brown family and the church family in your prayers, uh, we are grateful for his extended um, grace, what the Lord has done. We thank him for allowing Mr. Brown to be with us tonight. Uh, like I said before, a pillar in his community, a p pillar in his church, and a pillar in the bigger world. Uh, we are appreciative of him and his efforts that he's made. And tonight we would just want to hear a little bit about him. Like I said, if you guys will go ahead and start sending your questions over. But I did want to get this piece out of him. Uh, thank you for coming on, uh, first of all, Mr. Brown, as I was saying. And uh, I was going to ask if you will, sir, if you would just do me the favor of just telling the people that don't know exactly who you are, who you are, and uh, a little bit about your, your you know, uh, how you got your dog, your, your starting dogs, and maybe who you came up under. and. And then I'll follow up with the questions, if you don't mind. All right. Just a quick thing. I, I was raised uh, on a farm. I, I took care of the hogs and the dogs. Uh, my dad had over 100 foxhounds, and uh, I fed all of those. He was a principal and a basketball coach. And um, so I took care of all the slop, I guess, from the uh, lunch tables at the school and, and the good dogs got cornmeal and the, the average dogs got the slop from the uh from the uh, school and so i was raised in dogs all my life and um i actually started in beagles when i was 14. um even uh, the only time i didn't have uh dogs was when i was going to college so uh other than that i've always had beagles all my life and uh done done all right in the trials and competed uh, all my life. So uh, I'd say the last few years has been the slimmest because um, I've been uh, physically building a church building. And so uh, it's taken a lot of my time, but uh, I still have plenty of dogs and that sort of thing and still try to stay running all the time throughout the week. Hmm. Man, and I know those are two jobs that are very intense. So some of you all know about being in ministry. That's a job in itself. And then having the dogs, that's the second job. And then he's also a family man. So. <laughs> but it's, just, it's a whole lot more fun at uh, a couple hours a day. I thought I was going to retire two years ago. And I ran dogs six days a week, except on Sundays. And um, I found out it was a whole lot more fun two or three hours a day instead of... Uh, eight to ten hours a day mm. oh yeah yes sir absolutely and i want to ask you this um as far as starting off you know um what would you say as far as was some of the best things or how can i say it how what would you say was one of the main things that sort of compelled you outside of having that you know that uh that background and upbringing uh, as far as the history of coming around hunting and stuff like that, what would you say was the main thing that sort of geared you toward beagles sp specifically? You know, uh, outside of having foxhounds, what geared you toward beagles specifically, and what was your first beagle? Um, you know, the reason I liked them is because I could watch them. You know, with foxhounds, it was at night, and, uh, you know, you, you couldn't stay up with packs pack of foxhounds, and so, uh, I really enjoy them, watching them work, and I didn't even know anything about trialing, but um, uh, that's that's what really got me started. I love to watch hound work, and I love to watch dogs to see how, who could get it and how they could run it and that sort of thing like that. First dog I bought off the Rocky Hurt down Somerset, um, that was a trial dog trial bred. It was actually came from Herman Richardson, and some people may know him. He used to be an official major for the AKC and, and also the president of uh, Lake City Beagle Club when it was in its heyday, uh, when it was the biggest trial in the United States for SBO Beagling. Mm. Jesus. Now, out of, out of that same dog, did that dog, uh, particularly that you just mentioned, did that dog produce for you? Did that dog... Uh, put you, would you say, on the map type of thing, so to say, uh, as far as, you know, pushing you forward and getting you uh, off the ground, you know, engaging your momentum? No. Um, <laughs> be really honest with you, at the beginning, I, I really liked little males, and so I majored in, majored in males, and a guy that really affected me a whole 
whole lot was Paul Shore. Um, and he would always talk about the females no time, but he always had huge dogs. And I like the small, I like little males. And so I had uh, Rob Simon II, Black Bob, um, Tiny Bull. I think all three of those dogs are in the Hall of Fame. And um, I really like little males to run. And then I noticed that um, uh, Line Boss was really starting to produce. He had good females to produce. I really didn't have any really good females that would produce. I own probably one of the greatest winning females, B.B. Bonnie, in nice hunts, but really, I went to the derby runoff, I got the entry forms after everybody entered, and I went down through there and see if anybody had a young line boss, and so it happened that Paul Short had one, and um, later after the derby runoff, a couple weeks, I drove out to his house, he wouldn't sell me the dog, but I stayed there for eight hours till he did. And uh, <laughs> I bought Shorts Rosie, but it was really her pup that got me going. Mm -hmm. Her name was Shorts Dude. He gave me Shorts Dude. I had to pay really good money for Shorts Rosie, and I had to buy Shorts Dude's um, littermate sister that wasn't so good. She went on to produce a couple field champions, but she wasn't like Shorts do. He couldn't keep her in the pen, and that's the reason he gave her to me. She would crawl out or chew through wire, and so I got her, and from that is really when I started to develop my bitch line. And um, it was there that if you follow all the dogs, even the dogs I have in my kennel now, it came from that. And then one other female really produced and was very dominant for me, and that was Massey Creek Chloe. She was um, she was a really good bred. She's out woods chopper, and I still have her blood in my kennel. Mm. Those two lines of females, and I started majoring in big females then, and those two females were, I always look, that's what I have really still produces champion dogs. Uh, if you look back at that, short stews in that pedigree, but I think it's like eight or nine generations in a row now that's a that's a field champion. Uh, it was all the way up through, well, it's all the way up through this generation. I think it's eight. Uh, that's eight straight female champ, you know, generations of champion females. Mm. So those two, those two dogs really started my breeding program. I didn't have no breeding program. I was just hit and miss by a dog, come across a lucky breeding, whatever it may be, um, to really have dogs then. And then I really, I think, started becoming a breeder when when I got a hold of Short Stew. Mm -hmm. She's one of the most fabulous, stylish bitches that I'd ever saw. And still, even to this day, she's not... She couldn't, like, knock out a national. She did win one national, but uh, she was she was just really, she hovered on the line. She had a lot of animation, great nose, unbelievably straight, no matter who you ran her with. And she had a great quality that few dogs have. She loved second, no matter if she'd run with fast dogs or slow dogs. She preferred the second home. And, and at that time, she could really turn it out of, out of a pack and then take the lead and she was really a jealous dog that she'd give it up and give it back to another dog but if she had to run it she would but she didn't have to have it mm. wow <clears throat> now let me ask you this as far as those two lines would you say that uh, outside of them being able to help be the establishmentarians of who you were and what you, you know, would later come 20, 30 X amount of years later, uh, represent or begin to produce on a consistent basis. Would you say that the female line, I mean, we ask this all the time, would you say that the female line was the most important thing, uh, for you or could be the most important thing for any person that's deciding to be a breeder uh, deciding to be a gun hunter and they want to be consistent or want to have some kind of a level of consistency accountably in their kennel. Would you say the females are the key 
to the to the scope. Uh, well, I, here's here's what I would say. That would just only be common sense because you can take your best female to the best male, but you can't take your best male to the best female. Absolutely. So just common sense wise, you always want a, a, a really good female. Without a good female. You're just gonna hit and miss. It's you know, unless you already got a line of line of females, you know that that you can count on. Mm-hmm. And um, I think just common sense wise, that would be in any breed. He who owns the females is the one that controls everything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. I mean, you're gonna come across a, a producing male. You know, I've been very fortunate to. I don't know. I've just been really fortunate. Um, to really breed to good males, you know. So Jesse's Jesse Williams is male out there, uh, Cadillac, and so you know I. And also Shorts Pro, I get laughing. You know, a lot of people criticize Shorts Pro, but he had over a hundred field champions. I don't know what there is to criticize him about. Mm. Uh, uh, I just always say this: I don't care what the person is. I just want to know what the dog is. Okay. Mm. Yes, sir. So I'm going to breed anybody's dog. Anybody's dog. I don't care who it is. If they got good blood in them, you know, um, I can just tell you right now, that's that's what I'd go to. Mm. Yes, sir. One gentleman asked a question, uh, Mr. Brown. He says, what's the number one thing he looks for when starting a litter of pups? And what's the first quality he sees in a pup out of that litter that he calls them for? You want me to ask that question good again? Question. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. That's a good question. You know, the first thing, I, I feel like that the pup can really change. But you know what? When you breed out a field champion female and a good male, don't get in a hurry to call them. Just don't get in a, a, a you know, I just think about these last things. But I'm going to answer your question. The first thing I look for is something that has got some flow. Immediately, naturally talented when they start. It's not man-made, but when they start, after they have a rabbit or two, if they can flow on the line and carry it real straight, I'm looking for that. If a dog seems like it's having difficulty in the rabbit I just saw and it can't hardly move it 10 foot, it just wants to bear down on it so hard, I'm really not interested in that dog because... In brace trials, you're only going to shoot people to the high place. And I, I just found that flow is a big deal, just natural talent. Whether they can smell it, um, you know, there's a lot of things interacting all that. You know, if they don't have a big, big nose, I think really most people can tell that's messing with dogs if they've had very much experience or not. When they first start a pub, there's, a, there's that natural flow that they should have in them and that nose. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, I've had some dogs want to go too fast. Mm-hmm. But I've laid them up, let them settle down, let them grow up a little bit, try them two weeks later, you know, things like this. And, um, but if I don't, if I just see a dog laboring to run a rabbit, I'm not really interested in that dog. Mhm. Mm. Okay. I like that. I like that. And it makes sense. That okay. makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, one person asked a question. He says, "Which big female have you liked the most, and why?" <laughs> oh man, uh, big female. The, there, there's several that are very tight right there. You know, she was. She's been nominated for the Hall of Fame many times was B.B. Bonnie. Uh, She was just a winner, but she was an absolute dud in producing. She couldn't produce, and that's why people didn't nominate her to the Hall of Fame. She was nominated probably, and I didn't, I don't know if I put her at the top of my list, but I would nominate her, but I've just got to be honest with you. She just never could produce, but she was a, she was the greatest running Big female, under control, with hunt, intelligence, everything that I ever saw. And Art Mike being the greatest male to this day I ever saw run a rabbit. Those two stand out to me, not because they was, sometimes people act like if it's a long time ago, that's always their best. But I've never had a dog win whatever 
she won eight, nine national championships and uh, was in the money, you know, for three years and everything. And so she'd have to be the best runner, but she was an absolute zero as far as producing. Mm. Mm. That's just being real. I call it the way I see it, okay? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> now you know it's funny because it's funny a lot of people they they uh they would automatically assume you know and then you know i guess assume would be the proper thing to say uh presume but of course assume that just because the dog is dominant in the field that the dog is going to be dominant in the weapon box now are, are there any holes or were there any holes in that that you could have possibly said uh, back in the pedigree or somewhere, you know, back behind that female, where you can say, you know, uh, I can attribute this, 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 and this to. I know sometimes we can, but it would, is, is this a situation where you can say that? Yeah. You know what? Arnold Hornsby, which is dead, he actually faced Bonnie in four trials, and he came to me and he said, would you take Bonnie down there and run for me through the summer? I want you to condition her. I don't do that, but he was an older guy. He'd been good to me, and so I took her. And when I took her down there, I started running her. I said, man, I ain't never seen nothing like this in my life. And I think he was wanting to settle her. And so <laughs> he knew the type of guy that I am. Uh, that um, I would buy her. He priced her for six thousand. I I gladly gave six thousand dollars for her back then. That's eons ago. But uh, she was so inbred. You know, it was ate up with Deer Park Spike and Ike, and that was the only that was some of the bloodlines that was hitting the trials. And I don't know if if I would have line bred her, whether she would have done better. But I always outcrossed her. I, was, I don't want to act like I was some great breeder back then. I've learned a whole lot since just for trial and error and from other people. And I think that I, I actually, we actually did line breeder finally, but still nothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Zero. Mm -hmm. Zero. I never kept a pup. I wow. Kept, I, I, started, I started them, but I never kept a pup. They, you know, I just don't stay on something. If it ain't any good. I learned a long time ago. Let it go. <laughs> let it go. <laughs> mm. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Now, around you said when you say let go, can you define that for us? Around what about what time uh, would you say is a, the perfect time that you would begin to uh, you know analyze a dog? Or, let me say. Let me rephrase that that question. That intensely uh, evaluate a dog uh, to the to the point of you know, get rid of, let's say, you know, that um, you'd see that dog yeah. and say, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I just think that if you go through a winter season and a warm season, you know, in Kentucky, we have uh, severe winters more than down south, of course. I like to see if a dog, how they act in bad scent and good scent and in a couple different, like a, a spring, in a summer, mm -hmm. you know, where scent's really high in the spring, you can see what they look like. I'd always want to go down to see, run them in Sarisa. We don't have Sarisa right where I'm at, that, but the running grounds, I would want to go down and look and see what that dog looks like down at the running grounds or different grounds, take them three or four pumps. If I really start getting serious, just kind of keep on dwindling what I thought a dog should be. In hot weather, see mm -hmm. if they got a radiator or not. See whether they can have hold high scent, bad scent, good scent. Really, you find out whether you got a dog or not in the fall, man. Because you know it's so dry, and they have to really get down on it, and they have to have a good nose. It's probably the greatest season to really try a dog. Mm -hmm. September, October, up here. It may be different down south, but in Kentucky, September, October. Mm -hmm. mm. And I can appreciate and that. I stay long, and I stay, I stay longer with dogs that are out of field champion females. Mm -hmm. I stay with those dogs a little bit longer because my experience is some of those dogs are a little shaky maybe 
at the beginning, but because they got so they come back to their blood. Mm-hmm. They come back to their blood after a while. Mm-hmm. Mm. And um, and that's what I was going to say. I can definitely appreciate that because. You know, I think patience is one of the things that a lot of people have eliminated in, in, in so many different settings, whether it's trialing or gun hunting or bird dogs or squirrel dogs or coon dogs or people, whatever it is. I think the patience virtue has been one of the things that's really been eliminated. And, um, you know, what you just said, if we would hold out and sort of see what's going on, test the waters, stay with the waters, especially if you know the waters behind, especially coming through, like you said, that female side, is exactly uh, uh, what you were looking for from the giddy up, then uh, genetics has got to take over. But let me ask you this as far as uh, uh, potential, what are some of the things that you look for, and when are the times that you begin to look for those things in a dog? Not just in trials, but mainly, you know, of course, in trials, since that's what a lot of people know you by. But um, as far as in a dog that, you know, you know is going to be a special, special, just exceptional hound. What are you looking for in that dog, and around what time are you looking for it? Uh, one of the things I really say this, don't go to a trial unless your dog can solo an iron, a rabbit by itself. And I, I want to see if they can really run a rabbit, solo a rabbit. And then, um, you know, I think one important thing, I, I don't always share this, but this is an important thing, to have a dog in your kennel. If to have a dog in your kennel that is not enough to trial, but really close, a really good training dog, because if that pup, I have a dog right now that's very valuable uh, in my kennel, because I can take her and I can run her with any dog, and I can almost read that dog by that other dog. And um, that training dog is very valuable to me. I know if that dog does not have enough foot to run in front of that other dog, it's shitty going to make it. And um, at the same time, if that trained dog leads that other dog around and she can't get any checks or anything else like that, uh, I've wanted to have a, 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 a great trained dog at the house. Dogs are... I got one right now that she's only three years old. She places in trials, can't win one. But I can read a dog really quick with that dog. And I can tell you, this dog ain't going to have enough foot. You know, if they're nine, ten months old, you've been so long. There's dogs that can solo, but if not, they don't have gears in them to get up and change pace with other dogs. Because, mm-hmm. you know what? We don't get to run a rabbit by ourselves in field trials. We have to run against people. So they got to have they got to have a little edge to them um, to know, hey, if I get a hold of this thing, I can run it. But I'm big on soloing, on training, because to me, I'm not going to depend on somebody else to run a rabbit when I get to a trial. Mm-hmm. I'll run the rabbit. You just you come on with me. And until I get that dog to do that, and I know that it's got gears, I really wouldn't with that dog, you know. Mm-hmm. That's just some things I do. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. Now, is is gun hunting important? Is that a, is that a, a strong aspect that you would say could possibly or potentially turn the tables as far as the effectiveness or the accountability in a dog? In my country, I don't kill any rabbits because we're they're very sparse. And just to be honest with you, I'm an avid runner. I may run in the morning, run it all night, different dogs. So to me, I enjoy, and and this may sound bad, but also uh, I enjoy field trialing. But I understand this. If you don't hunt, you probably aren't going to search on the check very hard. Mm -hmm. So hunt is a big deal. If you got a dog walking around with you, Judges see that in the back of their mind. They're like, they're not going to put a win on a dog like that. I don't care who they are. If they're any kind of houndsmen at all, a dog's got to hunt and get their own game. And a lot of times what I do, I turn my one dog loose and let them jump a rabbit. I know they can solo. Just let them, just turn them loose and 
and let them get searched. Let them search on their own instead of all this man-made stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's some things that I look at. I, you know, when I was younger, I used to really be an avid rabbit hunter. But as I've got older, <laughs> we don't have because of people cleaning up spots and everything like that. I run in natural territory, but, you know, it's just hard to rabbit hunt the area that you're going uh, to run in all year round. Mm -hmm. Place for me out in the wild, and I normally run out in the wild most of the time. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Well, and that definitely makes sense. That makes all the sense in the world. My grandfather used to say that all the time. He said, "Son, if you if you kill a, if you kill kill all of them, kill every last one of them, you won't have any rabbits to run." And that made a lot of sense to me at first. You know, I was I was a, a, a trigger happy uh, individual. He thought I was off a of bonanza or something. You know, off a of rerun episode. <laughs> well, I was yeah. anything. I, mean, we, 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 I love to hunt. I love to hunt swamp rabbits, but you know. As times went on, they're not as plentiful in Louisiana as they used to be. But I'll go down there every year for a week or two, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, go and hunt all the time. Yes, sir. Now, let me ask you this. As far as when you begin to really put the pressure on one and, um, you know, you saw what you saw or you saw you, you was able to see what you needed to see in whatever time frame you put on that dog that – deemed or qualified that dog as a keeper okay when yeah. you begin to put the pressure on that dog you know how do you like to put the pressure on that dog to keep that keeps that dog from coming unglued or is there even a uh, specific type of approach that you take as you're beginning to uh, put the pressure on that dog because you know I've heard some people say that there is no way that some dogs that if they got it they got it they won't come unglued would you say that that's true or would you agree with that or uh. makes sense that makes all the sense in the world yeah that definitely makes all the sense in the world I love everything I do makes sense but that's what I do okay oh yeah hey look <laughs> you know and at the end of the day you know I'm glad you said that because you know at the end of the day I think we try so hard not saying we as in you and I but just hypothetically and generally generally speaking I think so many tr try so hard to actually be accepted in uh, their approach as far as how they like to do things or how they prefer, uh, you know, a thing. But, uh, you know, when you really know who you are and you know who you are, you know, it doesn't really matter. So I'm a, that's why I say it makes sense. I appreciate the fact that, you know, you do what you're doing the way that you do it. And, you know, nobody else can take away, they can take anything away from that. And that's why I believe that such success has came to you because, you know, you've stuck with that. Now, let me ask you this. What would you say kept you in the loop of being consistent and being submitted to the lines that you have had for so long. I've noticed that, you know, in doing my research just in this last week of you, you didn't jump ship a lot, you know, really at all. You didn't change, you know, a lot. You tried things, you brought things in, you implemented, you backed things out, you brought this in, you did that, you executed properly, you know. But uh, most people that's been in it as long as you, they can't do that. How did you stay committed to your families? Well, I, first off, I don't fall in love with anything. You know, 
that I, I'm not going to try to make a dog a producer. You know, I'm not going to try to make one a producer. I'm going to, I'm willing to drive 800 miles, I guess to say this. I was willing to drive to go out to Jesse Williams, breed the, his dog. I drove out Paul Shorts to breed the pro line boss. Um, I had to do it. I, I remember I bred a dog on the pro on Christmas Day. My wife said, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to get up in the morning. I'll be back for Christmas with family, but I got to go breed a dog out in Illinois. And uh, that's, uh, I was always committed. I don't care who's got or what they got. If I like the blood and it's got my, some of the dogs in my family where I could line breed, that would be it. And I just say this, to be great in beagling, all you have to do is breed one champion per year. That's all you have to do. You don't have to breed um, 30 champions a year. Best year I ever had in my life, I bred 14 dogs. 14 dogs turned out to be field champions one year. That was my best year. But I just, I just say this, if anybody can breed one field champion a year, they're going to be deemed great in daily. That's all you have to do. And do it for 10, 12 years in a row. So uh, <laughs> there's not a whole lot of people that can say that. You know, because if you look at some of the guys in the Hall of Fame, they've, they haven't bred quote, great numbers, but they have been consistent because they've had small kennels, but they was able to breed continually field champions. Consistently. And uh, consistent, consistency is the big deal. That's the biggest deal. Here in, you know what, everybody can finish one, breed one dog and finish it, but can they do one every year? If they can do one every year, they're great. Say for a 10-year period, 12-year period. That's greatness to me. You know, mm. that's, you, you breed them, you raise them, you train them, you finish them. That's a big deal. It really is. Mm. You know. Mm, mm, mm. One gentleman asked the question and says, how close do you uh, prefer to line breed? Okay. I like cousins. I've actually bred uncles. I just... I have not. I've tried it, father daughter, but I've learned from that. You have in the father daughter cross. You got to have. They got to run the same, and they've got to have each other's. That daughter dog has got to be exactly like uh, its father, and he's got to be almost perfect. Okay, and. If you don't do, if you don't have that, you may you pull in other things. Personally, you don't. I, I I may be wrong in this, so I may be speaking out of turn on this one. You just don't see too much success in the field trials in inbreeding, line breeding, yes, but inbreeding, I've not had any success with it. Mm -hmm. So I prefer not to do that. Uh, if an uncle to a niece is inbreeding, I get I do that and I have have success with it. But not father daughter or two litter mates together mm -hmm. stuff like that that people have tried and I've watched it with other people and they haven't had success either. I could be wrong. I'm just saying in my world, okay? Uh -huh. I don't know everything, and I'm not aware of everything, but what I'm aware of, it's not successful. Mm. <laughs> Man. So if I, what I'm looking for is to breed a stud dog that I have now to his daughter that runs almost, I mean, identical to him, and I would breed like him one time. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'll try it one more time. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. One individual asked the question. They said, who is your best male dog in your kennel and why? Uh, there's no doubt. My lifetime, there's, I've got the dog right now that's the greatest producer. I don't, because back say he is, that's Kaywood. And um, he's off Jesse's dog uh, right there. And a female I got called D2. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And that come up through that line of bitches. He is a freak. He's got a big gene in him. And he, the parents were only 13, three quarter, both of them. And then bred them together. And something in there, he controls it. And he can control. He's the, he's the best producer. He's the sire. And I realize there's a female. Out of the old, out of the greatest litter in AKC history, seven for seven, seven pups, seven champions. Um, I don't know real. And if I said how many, I really don't know how many K Woods got. But he's got he's he's at twenty or, or twenty plus, and I really don't know that answer. But I, I I'm gonna safely say, conservatively, twenty right now. He had seven in one litter. Okay. <laughs> mm. So, and I, I, I crossed one, uh, one female with him, and she has produced five field champions. Mm. So I know that's twelve, and I know another female that I had that Josh Sons had. There's three in that one, so that's fifteen. So if there's anybody else finish other dogs, which I would safely say five, five more dogs. I'm sure there's more than that. Wow. But he is, he, he controls it. He, he, you know, I, I say this, a good stud dog's a dog that don't mess up your good female. Mm-hmm. And, but he does control it. He does control it. Mm-hmm. And um, that's the best male I've ever owned in my life, as far as a producer. He won a national, when he's beautiful, he's straight. Uh, and his confirmation, and he's won a national, and um, he's a big dog who throws big dogs. Um, he, he can't. I haven't seen very. I don't, I don't even know a small dog out of him. I'm sure there are, but he just controls things. Like shorts pro. If you had a good female and you bred to him, he's going to get a field champion. If you bred to Jesse's dog. A good female, he was going to get a champion out of it. My first cross on Jesse's dog in D2, there was 10 pups, five of them finished. Mm. Next time, three. Three finished out of the litter. And then the one that Cadillac Kid came out of, uh, Full Court Press was a litter mate sister to D2. And I'm, I'm going to just say this I think there's three in that. I know there's three in that litter that's finished. So, you know, just. With Jesse's dog right there, Jesse Williams' dog, uh, that's, um, you know, that's 5'3". That was 11 champions. I bred another female to him, um, and she produced three field, she produced three field champions, and she wasn't a champion dog, but mm. she was out of great blood. She's out of the Chloe line. So that's, that's 14 field champions right there off the females I had around there. So, mm. It was good to cross the mountain and breathe. Mm-mm-mm. I don't know on Shorts Pro. I think I don't, I, and they're listed, but I I feel very confident I bred seventeen out of the over the hundred mm-hmm. Alpha Shorts Pro. But he was good. I was breed Once I saw that they were going to produce, once I saw that litter, I knew that I was I was in good shape. That's why I would go back to him. You know, I bred pro different females and had great success. One litter, all four dogs finished. Mm. Which four for four. Yeah. You can't really ask for much more than that. I mean, that's percentages is everything. One person asked a question, uh, Mr. Brown. They said, um, what about half-brother, half-sister crossing? I've never seen it work. I ain't had anything. I've watched other breeders that I respect. They don't get nothing. I've never seen it work to a great extent. And you know what? There may be 20 field champions out there. Again, just in my world, I haven't saw it. I watch, I, I listen to other guys that I respect. They haven't had any success out of it. Mm-hmm. Now, when you begin to look at a gene pool, and we know pedigrees aren't everything, but when you look at it, because they are a good indication, a great indication as far as what you can expect as far as uh, in receiving um, when it pertains to outcome, um, 
how far back do you usually tend to try to pinpoint or how far back in four generations, let's say, do you say uh, those dogs have some kind of effectiveness? I know everybody says, oh, every, the whole pedigree has an effect, uh, an effect, they have a say. But how far do you look at those dogs in that pedigree as far as you yourself personally? How far do you go back to say these are the ones that I'm looking at as far as being main uh, uh, applicable contrib- contributors? How, who would you say, how far, how far back would you say you go? Well, I'm going to answer your question. I'm going to probably answer different what you're asking. But the guy that's uh, a, a really good breeder is Teddy Atkins. He is probably, for as small as kennel as he's ever uh, had in his life, he's 85, I believe, and he's still trialing. He just won the AB, M, 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 MAB National All-Age. Um, his females... If, it, if I see a pedigree with his females in it, I'm interested. Um, I, I, I'd like to see, if I'm not acquainted with that line of dogs, I'd like to see two or three generations of field champion females. If they, I, I just don't have faith in dogs that can not consistently produce. And to me, I... The female I got now, it's got. She, I think she could go double digits before she dies. It's Clementine, but Teddy's actually the one who bred that female. But it has so much of the same blood that I've got, and uh, you know I respect that. And so I, I, I really try to see if if certain people's females that produce, if they're not in there, I'm not too much on it. I wouldn't want a stud dog out of something. That doesn't have a good family in it on the bottom. Mm-hmm. I just, I just wouldn't count on it. So he is a guy that has bred very successfully through the years. In three generations, I think in every decade, Teddy Atkins has won a national in the eighties, nineties, and two thousand. And, and and winning this, it may be in uh, three, de- four decades. So. That's pretty good for an 85-year-old man. I don't care what anybody says. <laughs> yes, sir. Hey, I agree. So, so I, I really, for me, if I was going to invest in a female, I'd have to see some of his blood in it or mine or PD's or some dogs that I know, mm-hmm. you know. Um, you know, so I'm not saying that something can't break out. Absolutely. <laughs> For me to invest at my age right now, I want to see at least two or three generations of field champions in the female line. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. And I, and I guess at this time, I'm going to slow it down a little bit and uh, get a little simpler. Uh, where did the Browns L.A. come from? Where did that name come from and, and uh, what is the significance of it? Uh, I have a little town I grew up in. Is Laconia. My dad was the school principal, basketball coach. It only had 65 people in it, and we called it LA. And so when we started, my dad was with me. He got rid of all these foxhounds. And so my dad traveled with me at every trial till he was 90 years old. Oh, wow. Uh, we rabbit hunted in Kansas when he was 87 years old. Uh, so Brown's came from, of course, our last name, and then L.A. is just the town I grew up in. Mm. Man, that's awesome. That is awesome. Now, uh, touching back in history a little bit, when you begin to talk about dogs like Rob's Diamond 2, Shorts Pro, and some of the other dogs that make up the plethora of rabbit dogs from the yesteryears, uh, what are some of the first words of descriptions uh, or uh, that come to mind when you think of dogs like Rob Diamond too. I know some people have given you know uh, brief descriptions, very vague descriptions, but somebody that's had the kind of you know closeness and that kind of uh, proximity, you know, uh, uh, affordance that you have had to such a dog like like that. How would you begin to descri- describe a dog like that? What kind of description comes to your mind when you think of those dogs? Um, 
Bob Steinman, and he couldn't get him started. I took him to the, the our Eagle meeting, and we auctioned him off, and he brought seventy-seven dollars and fifty cents. A guy named Dennis Slattery, Richard Sawyer's step grandfather, bought him for seventy-seven dollars and fifty cents. He started him that week, and the next Monday. I gave him five hundred dollars for him. Rob Steinman. The truth about Rob Steinman is this: he was great at one speed, but he was not great with you. He did not have gears in him. He did not have any gears. I'm just just saying the way that it is. And I bred to a female that had a lot of buzz bomb because he was buzz bomb breeding. I line bred that and came out with Black Bob. And Black Bob had so many years, he won nationals and everything else. It took a long time. It took almost 60. I sold him to a guy named Bob Anderson and he put him with Russell Dow. It took Russell 50 trials to finish Rob Steinman because he couldn't handle high rates of speed. He's in the whole thing. He produced. He was a great-looking male, black and tan, but he didn't have the gear that he needed. But his son, Rob Stein, I mean, Black Bob, did. And, and he could go up and down the line. And he really affected. Yeah, I tell you what, I was never so sick in all my life when I saw Black Bob. Mm. Because Dennis Cook, I priced him, and I said, if I don't win the Nationals, I'll sell him. Well, he must have been else before cell phones. <laughs> and he, he called me almost the, the minute I got into my house. He must have a spotter there. He said, you didn't win that trial, and I'm buying that dog. I said, I ain't going to sell him. He said, um, you're a preacher. You got to hold your word. I said, you're right. And I sold him. I was sick for two weeks. I could vomit. It was sick because it was sad to go run dogs, but I gave him my word, so I held to it. That's one time, if you ask Dennis Cook, that's the truth on that dog right there. But he became, he infected North Carolina and South Carolina a whole lot. Black Bob's blood still going out there. Mm. And he actually produced, and he was a great dog himself. He was a great dog in running. Rob Steinman just didn't have the gears. Mm -hmm. But a dog that a dog that was really good also was Tiny Bull that I had. He was a rule book dog. Didn't have high rates of speed, but he did hold himself straight in the line. And I, I bred eleven champions out of out of you know, before I sold him to a coon hunter, Randall Myers in Tennessee. And he studied him. He did very well with him. I don't know how many Tiny Bull's in the Hall of Fame also. Mm. That's just a little history right there. Mm. Yes, sir. Now, out of those dogs and those times uh, or time frames, those eras, who would you say would oh. be some of the better dogs? Or go ahead if you if you had some. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Well, I, I think I think Nip Otis. If you're going, I, the reason I didn't stay, I, I didn't keep that line is because I went to big females and big dogs, and that was small dogs. But you know, you had Armite. Uh, all BD's dogs, homebrew, line balls. Then you had in the South stubby dogs that did very well. Delray Stubby, he was really popular. You know, Iron Mike, he was he couldn't produce a male, but he could produce a good female, and he really he was an unbelievable dog. Uh, he finished in four trials. He measured out the other one, or he would have finished in three. There's no doubt in my mind. He was, he, you couldn't beat him. And um, so dogs, like Nip Otis, he was a, more of a front-end dog. And, you know, Blackjack came from that. And I've judged Nip Otis. I know him, and his, he's a dominant line still to this day. Nip Otis is strong. He controls size. He really, he will downsize you in his blood if you breed to him mostly. Um but dogs like that in that era, Tiny Bull, Rob Steinman, that was very popular back then. Rob Steinman was very, very popular because he had a great fast chop, no extra, you know, everything like that. So, you know, he did really well. Um, so that was just some of the different dogs because down south there was really 
Tennessee, Indiana. We really didn't go down to Alabama, Mississippi. It was there was a lot of Black Creek dogs, which is still very strong down in that country, still to this day. And uh, so that was just some of the predominant lines back then. Mm-hmm. That's forty years ago, you know. Oh so, yeah. <laughs> Now, with that they're said, still in there. they're still in there. They're still affecting. They're still affecting people. Yes, sir. You know, and that's what I was going to ask next. Um, as far as a sign of regression or progression, which do you think we lean to the wall more towards? Regression, where we reverted and went backwards, or do you think progression? Because listening to you about the kid dog and the K Wood, and then you talk about a dog like uh, the Rob's Diamond. You know, it's and that's impeccable that a dog had that kind of ability, but like you said, didn't so much as have the bre- the, the the gears. Well, that's a wide paint stroke because when you talk about dogs yeah. like the Kwood dog and where they came from, it sounds like that line did something, and that's what I ask. That's why I'm asking. Uh, where do you see it now as far as your you, line? I think you, I think you can count. I think you can count on more dogs, females right now. It's more predictable than then. Yeah. One gentleman asked the question, says, what's more important, good genetics or a good trainer? Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of great trainers. 
players out there. But it's to me, I want natural talent. I'm like Jan, John Calipari from Kentucky. I just go ahead and take all the best kids in the United States, <laughs> even if they only stay one year in basketball. I still would rather have talent. I just take talent. That's what I'm looking for. I want something when I look at it. I got a dog in my kennel right now, a young female coming up. She's talent. She's, over, she's, she's nothing but natural talents. Nothing's man-made about her. Mm. So <laughs> that's my that's genetics for for fact. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we get our egos out there and we think we can train everything, but I can tell you this: Come on. that ain't the truth. Come on, <laughs> come on, <laughs> man! I tell you, Mr. You Brown, gotta have you gotta have blood. If you ain't got blood. That's why. I, that's why I drive. That's why I would go to somebody else's house or whatever it took. I borrowed money. I took a loan out to buy a dog one time. Come on. That's how stupid I am, but I, I like that. I was dedicated. I wanted to win. Yes, sir. Come yeah. on. I tell you what, Mr. Brown, you keep preaching like this, we're going to have to send you an offering. <laughs> uh, oh, man, I tell you, man, the way you talking like that, man, you'll mess around and get the spirit to moving. I got you. But it's the I truth. Well, it's, we, need to, we, we definitely need that in America, okay? Yeah, you better uh, you better believe we it. Definitely need, we need that. Yeah. I, don't think, I don't care whether you go to church or not. We need some of that. Yes, yeah, sir. Know? Come on here. Watch out now. <laughs> yes, yeah. sir. Yeah. What, uh, one gentleman asked the question, says, how does he feel about all different types? Uh, excuse me. How does he feel about all the different types of trials? UKC, ARHA, Little Pack, Progressive Pack, et cetera, et cetera. Is it helping or hurting the beagle breed? I couldn't answer that over there on I don't go to those trials, so I'm totally ignorant about it. I've only heard stuff, but I, I, I think brace trials, SBO trials, small pack, what we do, in the dogs that I run, and uh, what I do with AKC, SBO, that's the only thing I know. I couldn't comment on that because I, I haven't been in one, so it's not even fair for me to even say anything like that. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. Another gentleman asked the question, uh, Mr. Brown says, what kind of, well, several asked the question, he said, what kind of feed do you feed, and what is the protein-to-fat ratio? I feed um, Perina 30-20 to about everything, except in the summer I may back Perina Pro Plan 26-16, but I found the dog food out of Perina is just really high. There's no corn, no wheat, no soy. I don't know why they quit it. They had chicken. They put it over to turkey and barley. But I, I will say this. It keeps your dog a little bit cooler. I like Trina because my dogs perform good on it. Mm-hmm. They also have a farm. They have a farm. They're one of, I don't know if any other dog food company does it, but they have over a thousand animals that you can watch them eat different types of dog food out of pups, out of the same litter for years and to me it's the best dog food and I don't I don't get any free dog food okay mm-hmm. I used to but I don't get any free dog food anymore I pay for it at tractor supply <laughs> <laughs> or wherever yes wherever sir I can get it the cheapest yes sir one, one gentleman asked the question Mr. Brown says what kind of dog was L.A. Bull Gator you know what he was a dog, the more you ran him, the more attached to the line that he got. And I don't really feel like, in my own heart of hearts, I should have won the AKC National with him. We went to a brace for over an hour. And the dog I got beat by as a Hall of Fame dog. But Bull Gator was more dog than uh, Tiny Bull, his dad. I actually leased a bitch from Wayne Thompson, and that was a smart thing that I did. I leased her. It's the only bitch I ever leased in my life. And I bred from that and got a couple field champions. And Bull Gator was a dog. The longer you ran him, the more dominant he became. Mm. Uh, Very few dogs are like that. But I don't mean rough. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, he would get, he, he had greater concentration as we went along. The tougher the, the tougher the competition, I won a national or two out of him. And, uh, he was a good male. I really liked him. Had good surge off the line, drove off the line and could control it straight. I do think back then straightness was in the judging was big deals, big, big deals back when I say 30 years ago. Straightness is still important, but sometimes now people will let them make a mistake or two more. And we probably were more uh, critical of not letting them make as many mistakes. And he could really run a lot of rabbit and not make mistakes. Hmm. Uh, one gentleman asked the question, said, did you ever have anything out of ABC Spike's image? No. No. Not that I know of. Mm-hmm. Not that I remember. No. Okay. And I want to ask you a question. How how important is confirmation to you? Or how important is confirmation, anymore. period? Yeah. Well, I just think this. Anymore, we went through people are not interested in crooked dogs, uh, bad bites and bad tails and all that sort of stuff. Because there's too many other good dogs that you can breed to. Mm-hmm. Don't so, I, I, I just think that, to me, confirmation, and I will say this, Jesse's dog really helped me in confirmation. He put a really good bark, tone, and confirmation in my dogs. They had bigger mouths for me. And, uh, you know, so that's, that's, you know, something I saw. Mm-hmm. The confirmation anymore, I just think that's a given anymore to me. Because mm-hmm. mm. I, I, I would get rid of one testicle dogs, give them, my wife's a nurse, registered nurse, and she can give them away at the hospital for people's pets, and they would love them, and that sort of thing like that. So those dogs, it's got an underbite, one testicle. If you see it, I tell you what, I ain't into that diabetes neither. If they have sugar fits, I get rid of them. I, I just call them. And when I say get rid of them, I give them to people uh, where Marsha works at, and um, they keep them as pets. But I, I just... I get rid of them. I don't want to get attached to them. If I see something, if prolapse shooters, I'm through. Mm-hmm. I'm going to give them somebody. I just, anything that I see, I just, I've already been through this. I'm too old now. I don't want it. If I was younger, it probably wouldn't bother me. You know, but now I'm 64. It does bother me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that's just my taste. Mm. Yeah, that's that's a that's a strong take. It makes sense to me because I, I'm I'm exactly the same way. I'm I'm not 64, but I I definitely uh definitely share the same sentiment. That's for sure. Um, I was going to ask the question when it comes to, um, and I know you've always run a hound that had this the accountability of the track. You know, I know some people uh, have said that they've went to you know the UBGF is is potentially geared up and engaged up to a faster hound and so forth and so forth. Um, accountability, you know, uh, accuracy, precision, words like this, phrases like this. I mean, I know it's a rhetorical question, pretty much, uh, and a very self-explanatory one or self-explained one. Um, how important is though are, the, are those things to people that really don't know? Some people really just don't know. That's why I asked that yeah. question. Yeah, they, you know, straightness is, you don't want to have a straight dog um, where you live at if it's not great scent. There's no doubt about it. Western Kentucky, where the Nationals is held, it's in Sarisa. They have so much better scent than what we do. Our soil depth, where I live at in Kentucky, is rocky clay, red clay. It's, you know, it's not as bad saying like it is in Georgia or South Carolina where I've run pine needles and, you know, very, very much good soil there. Or, you know, most eagle gloves are on bad dirt. But at the Nationals, that's why you have to be really straight because you're going to deal with high run. You, if you're going to run seven out of seven, you as well save your money and visit with your wife and take her shopping with that money because you ain't going to do any good. You're going to have to get 
it up, whether you want to or not, you gotta have those years. And you know what, this is the deal. And I'm gonna say this. Mm -hmm. To me, a field champion is much more valuable than a national champion. I'll just describe it like this. If I could, I, I, the bottom line is, if I'm not a field champion, AKC field champion, I don't put any stock in that a dog is a, is a national champion. First thing is, I've got great dogs that have been nothing but a field champion, but they've not been a national. It just It's like ice cream, and you put the bananas and the syrup on it and the nuts. That's what a national championship is. It's just your dog can go to a little bit higher level. But to me, I'll take a field champion. If somebody said, would you take a field champion or a national champion? I'll take a field champion every time. And I've won, I won a lot of nationals. Mm -hmm. mm. One gentleman asked the question, Mr. Brown says, what was the most important thing P.D. Short ever told or taught him? I think I would go a bit further to ask the question that he asked about what was the most important thing that he taught you. What, I would say, what would you say would be the most important thing the dogs have ever showed or taught you in the field? <laughs> you know what? That's a great question because B.B. Bonnie taught me how a dog should run a rabbit. She educated me a lot. And you know what? Watching really good dogs win but I'm going to tell you something. The females and the dogs that really become the best producers are the dogs that can run second and then overtake the top dog. That's a characteristic that most people don't have in their lifetime very often. They don't have a dog that would prefer the second hole but can run the front just great but not too greedy. That's a hard dog to find, but really, D.D. always said, and Pro was like that. Pro would run second, and he could really whack you, and then he would run it, and then he'd get the top dog picked up, the lead dog, and he would dominate the trial then. That's, I watched him win two trials, and when he finished, and he was, you know, that was a key ingredient. He'd always say that to me. Black Bob preferred the second hole. There's a few dogs that I've had that would prefer the second hole, but 
but could run the number one hole. Mm. Mm. One gentleman said that. The hard time. Hard yes, sir. Time. Yes, sir. One gentleman asked a question said, What age do you think most dogs hit their prime? Males hit it quicker than the females. I, I don't think it's hard to hold a male together when I mean top really compete win, not whether they're faulty. But I'll give a male a four or five. And then I, I think a female, you're you're really reaching for to try to compete at six. Mm-hmm. You know, when they get seven, they may place, but they can't win. You know, there's never between place and women. So mm-hmm. I, I think a female holds it together longer just to compete at a national level. I don't mean become faulty. I'm just talking about it seems like a male goes down quicker than a female mm-hmm. to me. Yes, sir. Uh, one gentleman asked a question uh, very similar to mine uh, previously. I think he actually chimed on a little later. He says, how often do you gun hunt over your dogs, and what's your take on gun dogs versus trial dogs? Well, I, I think one of you trial, you should gun hunt. Um, so I don't think you need to have gun dogs and not have trial dogs. The only thing I'm scared about, and I'll just be... This is just being really honest, okay? Mm-hmm. Number yes, one, you got people who trap. Who trap. Number two, you have dogs. I I I actually got um, uh, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. I took a field champion that I finished. Went down to Louisiana. Got bit by a tick. He got bit by a tick. He died. I thought I was going to die. And I can't, with good conscience, go out and run K Wood. That's, if it's not in an enclosure at my Beagle Club, because I'm not going to take a chance on getting him killed. He's too valuable. So, yo, know, and then you take somebody along. I think guys kill some of my dogs while wow. I, they accidentally shot them. I would start spray painting them and everything else. I learned as I got older, I'm not going to take people. <laughs> you know, you take a kid and he pulls up, shoots dog, what are you going to say to him, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, he thinks it's a rabbit. To me, if that dog's valuable, I'm not going to hunt it out in the wild. Mm-hmm. I'm going to have it in a protected place. Everybody to their own. Uh, but I'm not going to expose to a beaver trap or to, a sl- uh, you know, any kind of trapping or poison. People put out poison for coyotes. You know, there's all kinds of things can happen to your dogs out here. Yes, sir. I mean, and so if I, if I think something's so valuable, I'll probably hunt a lesser dog that's going to trial but doesn't have a name yet. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yes, sir. And I've been there on some of those very same instances that you're talking about. So I know exactly what you mean. Um, uh-huh. Let me ask you this. Um, as I begin to get ready to pull it, put it in and bring bring this thing to a to a close and let you do the benediction, uh, <laughs> if you had an opportunity to stand before God and man and speak a word to those young people that are just getting into it and some old that's been in it but really haven't came into the revelation of you know, what a rabbit dog is or what flow is or what straightness is or what productivity is or what consistency is, uh, accountability, accuracy, any of those things. And they, in, in, as far as uh, mentality comes or says, uh, goes about it, uh, they're, they're just coming into it too. What would you say to those people, mainly the junior handlers, what would you say to those people uh, if you had an opportunity to, to get them going? Well, three things. Number one, you got to have a motor. you got to have drive as an individual. You know, I, when I was raising my kids, I made them, I, I, I forced them to have a drive in life to create that in them. Number two, to be able to fight adversity. Not every trial is going to get called your way. It can be very discouraging to overcome when you first start trialing. And you've got to be you got to have a motor. you just got to want it more than other people. You go the extra mile. You drive the extra miles. You spend the extra money. And then you got to fight adversity. you got to be a competitor enough to shake off losses and your dog getting picked up. It 
you never find out what dinner is. And the third thing, which is to me, I, I'm going to say this. I'm, I'm blessed of God. I've been blessed because I had great parents. And God has favored me with good dogs. I, some people call it fortune. I call it the blessing of God. Every litter I find, I pray over. I say, Lord, I just speak a blessing over this litter. Come on, sir. Let it be like I think it should be, you know? Mm. And so, I, you know, I'm not trying to get super spiritual or anything. Oh, no, like go that. ahead. Yes, sir. I, I just, I, I, I do feel a blessing is like mayonnaise on bread. Good God. I'm blessed. I have been blessed. Yes, sir. And... So in the world, they call it lucky, a break, whatever it may be, whatever they make terminology for. Mm -hmm. But I know that God has been with me and been on me. And I'll tell you this, you can spend thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars in this stuff and not doing good. And there's people has got running pins and great kennels and unbelievable trailers and dog food and medicine and you know what they, they don't do any good in it to me and I'll say this get with somebody the best way to get to the top is to get with someone who is at the top and learn from them that's the quickest way to be good at anything get with somebody and you know I'll just say that about God. God God has had his hand. And I'm not because I'm a pastor, mm -hmm. but just simply, even when I didn't even know that there was a God, or let's just say I didn't serve him and wasn't a Christian, God's hand still was upon me. And I married a good woman, too. You know, that's a big deal in this thing. If your wife don't like it, I doubt if you're going to stay in this. I've got a wife that understands she loves for me to go to field trials. She loves for me to go because she knows I love it. It's a passion. And it's a way to get away from the everyday grind of in your position or on your job or your calling or whatever you do in life. And that's not discussed very often. I know a lot of people got divorced over dogs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know people lost a lot of stuff because of dogs because if you're if you're competitive you want to win and you're going to do you know if you play sports you always ask some of these guys they either they were some kind of they did something most of these guys they they understood how to fight upstream how to go against diversity they understood how to have a motor while you're sleeping they're training you know that's how they become successful <laughs> Mm. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, I tell you what, we're appreciative of your devotion that you have displayed over the many years, over the uh, copious amount of days, hours, months, seasons. You know, uh, not one effort has gone unnoticed. No, not one. And we are appreciative of that because it is gentlemen like yourself and many of those that sister and neighbor the same spirit just like you that uh, has really helped so many people. Uh, you helped me. You know, some people ask the question, why are you merging and bringing on different people as far as formats such as this or such as that or such as this? Well, because wisdom has no respect of person. And when wisdom is upon a person, wisdom is upon a person. There's no way that we can deny the fact that wisdom is clearly upon you. And uh, I think we're going to go ahead and get Brother Todd Roberts and Jason Potts to uh, get get that collection plate around there, sir, and you get it on around there, and uh, we're gonna take us off. <laughs> but no, uh, all actually, in all seriousness, we appreciate you, sir. We appreciate you, Mister Mister Brown. Uh, thank each and every one of you all for paying attention and chiming on tonight. You didn't have to do it, but you did. Look like we had. Looks like we had a great turnout. Uh, I'm appreciative of the fact that people come on and, and uh, they listen to what you know, uh, what, who we have uh, on at the time have to say. They give their undivided attention and they ask great questions. You know, um, we're just appreciative of you, sir. And again, if you guys would keep, uh, what is the name of your church again, Mr. Brown, Pastor Brown? Well, uh, the church I'm pastoring right now, I call it the Journey. Okay. If you guys would keep. You the, like that? 
Yes, you sir. like that name, The Journey? I love it. I love it. I absolutely the love church, it. The church before where my son is at, the one that I pastored for a long time, is called Grace Christian. But where I'm at right now, it's The Journey. Because mm-hmm. I'm on one. Yes, sir. <laughs> my goodness. I'm telling you, I'm appreciative. That's powerful in itself. And I'm going to ask that each and every one of you guys will uh, lift your hands. I'm playing. Uh, that each one of you guys would um, keep Mr. Brown and the journey uh, in your prayers, in your avid prayers, if you will, keep that place of intercession uh, for your brother. As some of the things that he said, um, we know to be scripture where he said that, you know, uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, you know, and how can you hear without a preacher? Uh, call for those things that be not as though they were. The heaven, even the heavens belong to God, but the earth has it given to the Son of Man. You know, these are things that we must practice in our everyday life. And I won't get all super spiritual on you guys, but we thank each and every one of you guys. I promise we're going this time. This is our last and final benediction. Thank all of you guys. Thank you, Mr. Brown. And uh, we'll be talking to you guys next time. Guys, uh, next Thursday, same time, same place, same campfire, different pioneer. God bless each and every one of you guys. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Thank you. Uh-huh. Bye-bye. Love, peace, and hair grease. <laughs> um, and I know you've always run a hound that had this.